Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Department of Design Media Arts grad lecture series. Tonight, Wendy Chun will be speaking on the enduring ephemeral or the future is a memory. Wendy Chun is an associate professor in the Department of Modern Culture and Media at Brown University. Her theoretical work addresses how political structures and ideologies and technology affect race, sexuality, and technological forms. Her first book, Control and Freedom, Power and Paranoia in the Age of Fiber Optics, explores how freedom had, has become coupled with control in digital instantiations such as the internet. Her other ongoing projects include a forthcoming book on the emergence of programmability called Programmed Visions, Software DNA Race, as well as another project on Imagine Networks that ask what needs to be in place in order for us to understand ourselves and our technologies as networked. Tonight, Professor Chun will question the newness of new media through the enduring ephemeral. Please welcome Wendy Chun. So <clears throat> thank you, Zach, for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here and to be able to share some of my newest thoughts with you all. Um, so, um, today I want to focus on the question of memory, um, on memory as both digital media's ontology and as its ideology, um, but also memory as both linking digital media to both the past and the future. Um, and so the talk today is divided into three sections, um, what will be, will be, um, two, as we may think, and three, moving memory. Um, now the talk is drawn from the book I'm currently finishing called Programs Visions, but also an article that will be coming out in critical inquiry later this um, year. So to begin, part one, uh, what will be, will be. Um, so the future what I find really intriguing is that the future is once more in new media studies in fashion, um, with the now embarrassing and utopian and dystopian hype over uh, the dot-coms and Y2K behind us, um, there seems to be a growing impatience with the so-called critical hindsight um, that emerged after the dot bombs of 2000 and after 9-11. And I want to emphasize that these were really sort of banal critical assessments that came out, like um, Stephen Levy in Newsweek wrote about the internet as a double-edged sword and the fact that the internet could be both good and bad. Um, but rather than even these banal assessments, um, the main strain of digital media analysis, both popular and scholarly, seems focused again on the future. So Howard Rheingold, who I'm sure many of you know through his popularization of both virtual reality and virtual communities, has written a book on the next big thing, um, smart mobs. Uh, you also have people speculating now rampantly on web 3.0, the semantic web, the web to come. Um, you also have even long-standing critical organizations, such as the really orny, ornery Australians in, uh, who run fiber culture, they recently had a uh, conference, the DAC annual conference in Perth, and they called it the future of digital media. Um, now this future 2.0, um, like Web 2.0, or 3.0 is not as utopian or bold um, as its mid-1990s predecessor, the future, right? So there are no upbeat yet um, paranoid commercials promising the end of racial discrimination and the beginnings of a happy global village. And just to remind you of those commercials, I'm just gonna play one by Cisco Systems um, in the background. Um, so this um, commercial was part of a large the web series has more users um, in, its first in which five they years. showed so sort of people from various tracking. parts of the, country, of the world um, addressing Americans and saying, you know, giving, offering internet statistics and then asking Americans, are you ready? Um, as well, there's sort of no 
must-read cyberpunk novels or films outlining its gritty, all-encompassing nature. Although what's interesting now is that new media is increasingly encompassing both nano and biotech. So when I was on the Rockefeller New Media um, panel, we were looking at a lot of work that would be considered biological. Um, this return to the future as future simple, um, the future as what will be, the future as what you will do, um, this future as a programmed upgrade to your already existing platform um, will no doubt recede and then reappear again. Um, for new media, uh, like the computer technology on which it relies, races both towards the future and the past. Um, it races towards what we might call the bleeding edge of obsolescence. Um, and to some extent, this stems from the modifier new, right? To call something new is to guarantee that it will one day be old, that it will be obsolescent. Um, but this cycle is also driven partly by economics. Um, the constant return of the new in new media is linked to the promise of financial returns. So Silicon Valley has recovered from the dot bombs, Google's trading well over $400, iPods and iPhones are everywhere, um, and the Hollywood writer strike was over new media. So there's a sense that something has changed. Um, Kids just aren't watching TV on TV anymore. You have Psy World um, in South Korea, which is extremely popular. You have Orkut in Brazil. Um, Facebook has now moved in the US from college campuses to the English-speaking public in general. And Michael Zuckerberg um, is now apparently um, more popular than Larry Page and Sergey Brin in Silicon Valley. Um, YouTube is impacting um, U.S. presidential elections, and CNN now covers blog content as um, breaking news. Um, so this return to the future in new media and its study is also linked to a perceived crisis within net criticism. Um, so when in 2001, Lev Manovich sort of chastised all new media theorists um, for focusing on the future and future technologies rather than actually existing technologies. And here, Lovink and Peter Lunenfeld um, argued against so-called vapor theory. Um, their criticism seemed to be um, a well-deserved one, a, a, a call for theorists to wake up from their virtual reality or their consensually hallucinated cyberspace, their, tend to tr their tendency to treat hype as reality. Um, but what's happened, though, is that the, engaging the present hasn't been so easy. Um, William Gibson, who moved from writing about the future to the present, his books have not sold so well. Um, and it would seem, perhaps, that actually existing media technology or objects are rather boring or, more importantly, have a short shelf life. Um, speed and variability apparently confound, make impossible, make difficult uh, critical analysis. So as Heert Lovink has argued, um, because of the speed of events, there's a real danger that an online phenomenon will already have disappeared before a critical discourse reflecting on it has had the time to mature and establish itself as institutionally recognized knowledge. And Mackenzie Wark has indeed argued that the speed of media events that um, travel on these lightning fast vectors actually frustrate the sort of homogeneous empty time that's need, needed, he alleges, for thinking. Um, now, this short half-life of much digital media and its malleability seems really to go against a fundamental tenet of humanities research, um, namely the reproducibility of sources. You should be able to go back to a source that's been cited. Um, but we can't now, either because our pages have been personalized just for us or because things rapidly disappear. Like, think about writing about a currently existing Facebook entry. Um, 
So a corollary of um, Hirt's uh, assessment here would seem to be that much established new media criticism actually deals with media objects that no longer exist. And I'm constantly fascinated by the increasing role that documentation plays um, in new media arts. And it would seem that documentation is more and more usurping the new media object. Um, so in response, here at Lovink and Mackenzie Wark argue that theory itself needs to change. Um, so what they argue for is theory on the run or theory as event. Um, and they argue that, in other words, we need to take on the same temporality, the same speed as digital media, um, rather than standing outside its modes of dissemination. Um, but importantly, they still publish books. I mean, they're not as prolific as Slavo Žižek, but they're pumping out books um, all the time. Um, and although I'm certainly sympathetic to this argument that theory itself needs to engage with the time and the means of digital media, and I'm part of a group um, that Tara McPherson at uh, USC is also part of, a Mellon-funded uh, grant to actually change visual culture research, um, I also think that we need to think beyond speed. Um, we need to get beyond Paul Virilio. Um, because for one, the fact that the present is hard to engage, or that by the time we finally know if something's true or not, it might be too late, is hardly profound, right? So think here of global um, warming research, right? Global warming researchers constantly argue that by the time we know whether or not their predictions are true, it's too late. We need to act now in a rather uncertain future to make sure an uncertain, sorry, uncertain present to make sure an uncertain future will not come to pass. Um, also, ephemerality is hardly new to new media, right? Television scholars have been dealing with questions of ephemerality for years, and they've been doing it by theorizing TV in terms of flow and liveness. Um, so why the crisis? Um, well, a couple of things. Um, first, network new media um, does not follow the same logic of seriality as television, right? Programming new media and programming televisions are significantly different enterprises. Um, and just to remind you um, of what TV uh, programming used to look like, let me sort of show you some rather remarkable 1950s uh, television. So flow and segmentation can't quite grasp dig digital media's ephemerality. Um, secondly, digital media with its memory, importantly, was supposed to be the opposite of. It was supposed to be the solution to television. That is, new media scholars' blindness to the similarity between new media and television um, is partly ideological. And it stems from this overriding belief in digital media's memory. Digital media as memorable, um, TV as liveness and ephemeral. When TV was still TV, memory supposedly marked the difference between new media and television. So unlike TV, digital media, digital media's content, um, like the programs it runs, was supposed to be available 24-7, right? The, uh, Digital media, in other words, is supposed to be always there. And more generally, the always there-ness of digital media was to make things more stable, um, was to make digital media more lasting. And digital media, through the memory that was supposedly at its core, was supposed to solve, if not dissolve, all the archival problems we seem to be facing with our media on problems such as degrading celluloid um, and scratched vinyl. It wasn't supposed to create archival problems of its own. Um, so that is uh, the major category of digital media is memory. Memory is posited as its ontology at all levels, from hardware to software, from interface to content, from CD-ROMs to RAM and ROM, 
Um, computer hardware is riven by memory, um, which makes porous the boundaries of the machine. And the Internet's content, memorable or not, is similarly shot through with memory. So many websites and digital media products projects focus on preservation. So from online museums to YouTube phenom, geriatric 1927, I don't know how many of you follow him, but he's fabulous. But he really does believe that he has to give over to all his YouTube viewers his life, that somehow this, this uh, technology will hold in memory his life. Um, from Corbis to Google databanks um, that record every search ever made and link it to an IP address. This is why people are talking about Google as the Stasi resource for the 21st century. Um, memory allegedly allows digital media to be an ever-increasing archive in which no piece of data is ever lost. Um, and now this always thereness of digital media is also what links it to the future as future simple. The future as what will be. The future as something programmed. Um, and more damningly, perhaps, it was supposed to put in place the future um, through constant exposure. So, for instance, as many of you are aware, the YouTube election, the election, um, last election was called the YouTube election precisely because um, of this clip of George Allen, which I'll play for you. My friends, we're going to run this campaign on positive, constructive ideas. And it's important that we motivate and inspire people for something. This fellow here over here with the, the yellow shirt, Makaka, or whatever his name is, he's with my opponent. He's following us around everywhere. And it's just great. We're going to places all over Virginia. And he's having it on film, and it's great to have you here. And you show it to your opponent because he's never been there and probably will never come. So it's good for you. Rather than living inside the Beltway, or his opponent actually right now is with a bunch of Hollywood movie moguls. We care about fact, not fiction. So welcome. Let's give a welcome to Makaka here. Welcome to America and the real world of Virginia. And my friends, we're in the midst of a war on terror. All right, so he allegedly, he, he claimed that he didn't know Makaka was a racial slur. Um, now, what's intriguing is that in response to this clip, um, the New York Times argued, um, if any moment of a candidate's life can be captured on film and posted on the web, will the last shreds of authenticity be stripped from our public officials? Um, but intriguingly, this formulation assumes that racist slurs are the authentic and the true, right? And it also assumes that public exposure always affects behavior for the good. Um, however, given the legion of students, my own students, have the most incredibly um, um, uh, ex uh, uh, open Facebook entries, um, entries which they know that their people who will, who will be interviewing them for jobs can also access. Um, given this, and also given the fact that George Allen knew he was being taped, he was pointing to the person who was recording them, it would seem that this ideal that public exposure will somehow automatically be linked to some sort of good behavior is itself being called into question. Um, but regardless, in terms of digital media's memory and the link between the memory as past to future, um, digital media was supposed to, in its very functioning, encapsulate the Enlightenment ideal that better information leads to better knowledge, which in turn guarantees better decisions. As a product of programming, it was to program the future. Um, part two, as we may think. Um, now, this conflation of description with prescription, the desire for programmability, is made, made most clear in the canonization of Vannevar Bush's As We May Think. And just um, how many of you have read Vannevar Bush's As We May Think? Right. Um, so this article is on almost every um, intro to digital media syllabus, and its importance is never understated, right? And this is partly because people like Ted Nelson, who coined the term hypertext, as well as um, the creator of the mouse, Douglas Engelpart, have 
claim that this article directly inspired them. And this article is also viewed as a precursor to the internet. Now, the fact that the Memex, um, the machine prophesized by Bush but never built, is considered a precursor to the internet should really make us pause. Because the Memex, this thing he um, envisions, is fundamentally an analog and mechanical machine. Um, but by conflating the Memex and the internet, I want to argue the ephemerality of digital media is covered over. And more importantly, the question of forgetting, the question of degradation, which lies at the heart of so much digital media technology, um, is glossed over. Um, is, becomes a problem for the media to solve as one medium becomes the memory of the next. Okay, so in Bush, in As We May Think, writing at the end of World War II, argues that the crucial problem facing scientists and scientific progress is access. And he argues that a record, if it is to be useful to science, must be continuously extended, it must be stored, and above all, it must be consulted. However, um, publication has extended far beyond our present ability to make real use of the record. The summation of human experience is being expanded at a prodigious rate, and the means we use for threading through the consequent maze to the momentarily important item is the same as was used in the days of square rigged ships. Um, so then to adequately access um, the scientific record, he proposes a mechanical solution, the Memex. And here I'm going to show you an animated clip um, produced by Dynamic Diagrams, which is a Providence-based um, design studio devoted to information on the computer screen that goes over the main features of the Memex. The owner of the Memex, let us say, is interested in the properties of the bow and arrow. He has dozens of possibly pertinent books and articles in his Memex. First he runs through an encyclopedia, finds an interesting but sketchy article, and leaves it projected. Next, in a history, he finds another pertinent item and ties the two together. Thus he goes, building a trail of many items. Occasionally, he inserts a comment of his own, either linking it into the main trail or joining it by a side trail to a particular item. His trails do not fade. Several years later, his talk with a friend turns to the Turkish bow. In fact, he has a trail on it. It is an interesting trail, pertinent to the discussion. So he sets a reproducer in action, photographs the whole trail out, and passes it to his friend for insertion in his own memex. Now, there's just so much to say about this clip itself. Um, the really sort of bizarre, invisible first person, the clean lines that are supposed to invoke both the past and the future. Again, this idea of the bleeding edge of obsolescence. Um, the voiceovers, um, the idea of a current design firm using the Memex as an example of the future of information. Um, also, the use of animation to display something that has never and can never be built um, is part of what I've called a frenzy of and a decline in visual knowledge. Um, but what this clip really nicely brings out is the analog nature of the Memex. Um, and Bush's inspiration for this kind of associative linking was the human mind. But what this brings out is that what the, why the memex was even better than the human mind was allegedly because its trails would never fade. Right? Um, but of course, trails would fade, microfilm fades and breaks, but this glossing over of the actual physics of our technology, the actual physics of our storage medium, actually grounds a certain progressivist 
ideology, um, as does the belief that the content somehow can stand outside of context. Now, Bush did not undersell the importance of the memics. Um, indeed, he argued um, that man needs to mechanize his records more fully if he is to push his experiment. And here he's referring to human civilization. But for him, it's the same as weapons development um, to its logical conclusion and not merely become bogged down part way there by overtaxing his limited memory. His excursions may be more enjoyable if he can reacquire the privilege of forgetting the manifold things he does not need to have immediately at hand, with some assurance that he can find them again, uh, find them again if they prove important. And not only would we be granted once more the privilege of forgetting as if any of us have ever been um, outside of forgetting. I don't know about you, but I'm going through early Alzheimer's. And I actually find this a really liberating and wonderful experience to be able to forget all that stuff. Um, so it was to do this um, without, while also saving us from repetition. For the danger of non-mechanically induced forgetting is repetition. Um, so when Memex revisited, which is an interesting repetition of as we may think, and you'll see here, he uses a lot of the same phrases. Um, he writes, an Austrian monk, Gregor Mendel, published a paper in 1865 which stated the essential bases of the modern theory of heredity. 30 years later, the paper was read by men who could understand it, but for 30 years, Mendel's work was lost because of the crudity with which information is transmitted between men. The situation is not improving. The summation of human experience is being expanded at a prodigious rate, and the means we use for threading through the consequent maze to the momentarily important items are almost the same as in the days of square-rigged ships. We are being buried in our own product. Tons of printed material are dumped out every week. In this are thoughts, certainly not often as important as Mendel's, but important to our progress. Many of them become lost. Many others are repeated over and over and over. So the scientific archive, rather than pointing us towards the future, is trapping us in the past by making us repeat the present over and over again. And this is what the Memex was supposed to save us from. Now, in Bush's writing and in presumptions about the information revolution more generally, there's no difference between access to and understanding the record, um, between what would be called perhaps symptomatically machine reading and human reading and comprehension. No difference between information and argument. And it's assumed here, and in all these prophecies about the information age more generally, that reading is a trivial affair, a simple comprehension of the record's content. There's no misreading, no misunderstanding, only transparent information. So if the scientific archive has not advanced, if thought is repeated, it's because something has not been adequately disseminated, adequately spread. Bush's argument assumes that human records make possible the construction of an overarching archive of human knowledge in which there is no gap. There is no absence, a summation of human knowledge. The scientific archive thus restores to man, or should restore to him, everything that has eluded him. So if there is a discontinuity in history, it's due to a historical accident, to our inability to adequately consult the archive, um, rather than human fallibility. Um, this accident, however, cannot be solved by machines which are viewed here as surprisingly accident-free. And I'm always surprised that people write about technology as if it always works. Um, a machine alone cannot turn an information explosion into a knowledge explosion. It cannot fulfill the promises of what Michel Foucault has called traditional history. And this definition of uh, traditional history is precisely this idea that Bush puts forward. And as the case of Mendel reveals, the problem is not access, but rather larger epistemological frameworks. Um, so just briefly, all three researchers who performed similar experiments to Mendel consulted the archive 35 years later and found Mendel, which means Mendel was not lost. 
Um, and indeed, the question is um, not why didn't people build on Mendel right away, but why and what exactly was rediscovered in 1900. And so Jan Sapp has this really influential article called The Nine Lives of Gregor Mendel. Um, and he argues that this constant rediscovery of Mendel is actually linked to the desire of geneticists to argue that they are the true heirs of Gregor Mendel. Um, so repetition is not evidence of thought wasted, but rather th of thought disseminated. Repetition, as Jacques Derrida has argued, is also the fever, the destruction, the forgetfulness at the heart of the archive forgetfulness, repetition that both makes possible and impossible the archival process. The pleasure of forgetfulness is to some extent the pleasure of death, the pleasure of destruction. And I don't know about you, but I for one actually celebrate when my hard drive crashes, especially if I lose my inbox. Um, but it's no accident that this supplementing of human memory has also been imagined as the death of the human species in so many fiction and films, and deja vu, the mark of the artificial in the matrix. Um, the example of Mendel as source is also revealing because our belief in sources, Mendel as the source of genetics, the memics as the source of the internet, code as the source of our computers is ultimately based on a conflation of storage with access, a conflation of memory with storage, a conflation of word with action. It is based, in other words, on a powerful logic of sorcery. Um, and this belief depends on our machines as more stable, as more permanent, and thus somehow better record keepers than human memory. It depends on an analogy between digital and analog media, a belief that's remarkably at odds with the transience of discrete information and the internet. Digital media is not always there, and we suffer daily um, and frustrated daily with digital media sources that simply disappear. Digital media, in other words, is at its heart degenerative, forgetful, erasable. And this degeneration is what makes it perhaps a device for history, but only through its ahistorical, through its memoryless functioning, through the ways in which it constantly transmits and regenerates text and images. Um, so part three, moving memory. Crucially, memory is not static, but rather an active process. A memory must be held in order to keep it from moving or fading. In the sense, it's a capture. Um, memory does not equal storage. Although one can conceivably store a memory, um, storage usually refers to something material, substantial, as well as to its physical location, right? So a store is both what and where it is stored. And according to the OED, to store is to furnish, to build stock. Storage always looks towards the future, memory towards the past. In computer speak, one, review, one reverses common language and stores something in memory. This odd reversal in the conflation of memory and storage glosses over the impermanence and the volatility of computer memory. Um, but without this volatility, without this degeneration, there would be no memory. And importantly, memory stems from the Sanskrit word for martyr um, and the ancient Greek term for baneful and fastidious. Memory is an act of commemoration, a process of recollecting or memory. Um, and so memory as an active process is seen quite concretely in early forms of regenerative memory, from the mercury delay line, um, which you see here, to the Williams tube. So a serial mercury delay line took a series of electrical pulses and used a crystal to transform them into sound waves which would make their way relatively slowly down the mercury tube. And at the far end, the sound waves would be amplified and reshaped. And one tube could usually store about 1,000 bits of data. Um, and here you see as well uh, the Williams tube, which worked through the same notion of degeneration, but here electrical charges as opposed to sound waves. But again, this idea that somehow um, digital media memory contains within it older forms of analog media is really fascinating. 
Um, current forms of memory also require regeneration. Today's RAM is mostly volatile and is based on flip-flops and transistors and capacitors which require a steady electrical current. Although we do have forms of non-volatile memory such as flash memory made possible by better insulated capacitors, they do have a limited read-write cycle, right? So your flash drives will die soon, back up everything. Um, Thus, as Wolfgang Ernst has argued, digital media is truly a time-based medium, um, which given a screen's refresh cycle and the dynamic flow of information in cyberspace, turns images, sounds, and text into discrete moments of time. These images are frozen for human eyes only. Or as Lev Manovich puts it, the question is no longer where is an image, but when is an image? Um, information is dynamic, however, not only because it must move in space, which is their argument, but also, um, and more importantly, because degeneration makes memory possible while simultaneously threatening it. Digital media, which is allegedly more permanent, more durable than other media, such as film stock and paper, depends on a degeneration we so actively deny and repress. This degeneration, which engineers would like to divide into the useful versus the harmful, so erasability versus signal decomposition, a signal versus noise, belies the promise of digital computers as permanent memory machines. If our machines' memories are more permanent, if they enable a permanence we seem to lack, it's because they are constantly refreshed so that their ephemerality endures, so that they may seemingly store the programs which drive our machines. Um, this enduring ephemeral, a battle of diligence between the passing and the repetitive, also characterizes content. So internet content may be available 24-7, but 24-7 what day? Further, if things constantly disappear, they also reappear, often to the chagrin of those trying to actively erase data. And I don't know if any of you have tried to erase something about yourself on the web, but that difficulty of erasure is really intriguing. Um, and this is partly because there's this wonderful site, which I'm sure many of you know, called the Internet Wayback Machine. Um, and what the Internet Wayback Machine does um, is it stores everything uh, with a six-month delay. Um, so like search engines, the Internet Wayback Machine comprises a slew of robots and servers that automatically um, back up most web pages. Also like search engines, they collapse the difference between the Internet, um, whose breadth is unknowable, with their backups. Like as many of you know, when you search something on Google, you don't search the Internet, you search their database. Um, however, unlike these search engines, the Wayback Machine does not use this data to render the Internet into a library, but rather use these backups to create what they call the library of the Internet. Um, now, the library the Internet Wayback Machine creates is certainly odd, right? There's no content-based cataloging. Um, this is because the Wayback Machine's head librarian is a machine only capable of accumulating different texts. So at one point, the Wayback Machine was dedicated to only archiving, quote unquote, important websites. But that became too much work, right? So they decided to archive everything because that was much easier. Um, now, the Wayback Machine is rather strange, but its greatest oddity um, arguably stems from the fact that, as you can guess, it also archives itself. Right? So you have this weird logic and embeddedness within this archive. But logically, the Wayback Machine is also recursive. So these imperfect archives um, are supposedly crucial to the ongoing relevance of libraries. So on the About page, um, the forces behind the Wayback Machine argue um, that libraries exist to preserve society's cultural artifacts and to provide access to them. If libraries are to continue to foster education and scholarship in the area of digital technology, it's essential for them to extend those functions into the digital world. Um, the need for cultural memory drives the Wayback Machine in libraries more generally. And noting the loss of early film archives due to the recycling of early film stock, the archivists state that they're building an internet library because um, without 
cultural artifacts, civilization has no memory and no mechanism to learn from its successes and failures. And paradoxically, with the explosion of the internet, we live in what Danny Hillis has referred to as our digital dark age. The Internet Archive is thus working to prevent the Internet, a new medium with major historical significance and other born digital materials from disappearing into the past. Um, so the Internet Wayback Machine is necessary because the Internet, which is in so many ways about memory, has no memory, at least not without the intervention of something like the Wayback Machine. Of course, other media don't have a media, um, memory as well, but they do age, and their degeneration is not linked to their regeneration. As well, this crisis is brought about because of this blinding belief in digital media as memory. This belief in the internet as cultural memory, paradoxically, threatens to spread this lack of memory everywhere and plunge us negatively into that way, way, way back machine, the so-called digital dark age. The Internet Wayback Machine thus seeks to fix the Internet by offering us a machine that lets us control our movement between past and the future by regenerating the Internet as a grand scale. Um, but the Internet Wayback Machine is appropriate in more ways than one, um, because web pages link to rather than embed images, which can be located anywhere, and because link locations always change, the Internet Wayback Machine only preserves a skeleton of a page filled with broken, that is, rendered images. And here you see their backup of my very first uh, web page, circa 1996, um, as a grad student. Um, these pages are not quite dead, but not quite alive either. Their proper commemoration requires greater effort. These gaps, the skeleton, not only visualizes the fact that what is not archived in the same way is not experienced in the same way, that our constant repetitions and regenerations affect what's regenerated, but also um, the fact that these gaps, the irreversibility of this causal programming logic is also what opens the web as archive to a future that would not simply be memory upgrades of the past. These gaps, in other words, these gaps uh, stemming from the lack of reversibility of programmability seems to open the future to something other than future 2.0, 3.0, etc. cetera. Um, and I want to, the last example I want to show you um, are blogs. Now, blogs um, and, and through blogs talk about repetition and regeneration as opening the future by creating a non-simultaneous new, a non-simultaneous new that confounds chronological time um, they also enable. Okay, so blogs seem to follow the time of newspapers in their plotting chronology, um, but blogs also contain within themselves archives of their posts, making the blog, if anything, like the epistolary novel. Um, unlike the epistolary novel, however, banal, um, was focused around a plot or a moral, uh, the blog entries are tied together solely by the presence of the so-called author. Um, and here you see a blog by one of my um, fantastic PhD students. Um, what makes a blog uninteresting is not necessarily its content, right, which reads like things I did today or things I have to do tomorrow, um, but rather its immobility. The ever updating, inhumanly clocked time in which our machines and memories are embedded and constantly refreshed makes its material stale. Um, the chronology seemingly enabled by this time is also compromised by these archives and the uncertainty of their regular reception. So an older archive, an older post, can always be rediscovered as new, and because um, it's embedded in this time, a new post is always already old. Right? And this non-simultaneousness of the new, this layering of chronologies, means that the gap between call and response in high-speed telecommunications may be dwindling, but because everything is endlessly repeated, because response is demanded over and over and over again, what is more important is repetition than speed. 
Um, and the new, importantly, is sustained by this constant demand to respond to what we do not yet know. Right? So the goal of new media czars is to constantly create desire for what one has not yet experienced and make people believe that what one has not yet experienced is the new, right? to turn uncertainty into newness. Also, in a rather perverse uh, reversal of the traditional newspaper, um, we pay now for old news. Right? Old news used to be discarded. Um, we now pay for archives. Um, current copies are free. We pay for what we might have missed. Um, so to put it bluntly, this non-simultaneity of the new, this enduring ephemeral, means that we need to get beyond speed as the de defining feature of digital media or global network communications. Paul Virilio's constant insistence on speed as um, as distorting space-time and on real-time and as rendering us susceptible to the dictatorship of speed has generated much good work in the field but can blind us to the ways in which images do not simply flash up and, ass and assault us at the speed of light. Um, just because images flash up all of a sudden does not mean that response or responsibility is impossible or that scholarly analysis is no longer relevant. Indeed, as the news obsession with repetition reveals, an image does not flash up only once. And the pressing question is, how and why is it that the ephemeral endures? And what does this constant repetition and regeneration of information affect? What loops and what instabilities does it introduce to the logic of programmability? Loops and instabilities that rather perversely sustain new media as new. Um, digital media networks are not based on the regular obsoleteness or the disposability of information, but rather on the recessibility and on the undead of information. Even text messages, which seem to be about the synchronous or the now, enables an endless circulation of forwarded messages, which are both new and old. And reliability, importantly now, is linked to deletion, right? So a database is considered to be dirty if it does not actively erase data. Um, so what I find fascinating is that the best way to hide now is in public, and also by um, producing multiple persona, right? If you want publicity, um, advertise many different versions of yourself. Um, also, this repetition, rather than detracting from the message, um, often attests to its importance. So you know a message is important if you've received it over and over and over again. So to conclude, rather than getting caught up in speed, what we must analyze as we try to grasp a present that is always degenerating is the ways in which ephemerality is made to endure. What is surprising is not that digital media fades, but rather that it stays at all through our human and inhuman efforts, and that we stay transfixed by our screens as, it, as its ephemerality endures. Thank you. Are there any questions? Hi, um, my name is Lily, and I really appreciated your configuration of memory as a dynamic, active process. And one thing I wanted to kind of dig out a little bit more is your notion of repetition. And at one point, you describe repetition as a kind of non-mechanical forgetting. And um, as somebody in the social sciences and somebody in information studies, it seems like repetition, in fact, isn't, isn't just about uh, a repeating actually, but it's actually displacing things into n something new and recontextualizing. Mm -hmm. So in the case of like people talk about remix all the time and right. the idea of forwarding emails and kind of that viral mode of, uh, of, of dynamics in new media and, and networks more broadly, it seems like repetition um, needs to be configured a little bit more dynamic in the same way that you reconfigured memory and forgetting in this way. Oh, absolutely. And so what I was trying to oscillate 
between is the notion of um, repetition as being linked to forgetting, but also repetition as being linked to dissemination. Right, so it's only if something is repeated that it's been disseminated. If something, like, so Bush's dream is, if we had the memics, then we wouldn't repeat things. But if we didn't repeat them, they would actually be lost. Right, exactly. um, so again, repetition is linked to dissemination and to forgetfulness. So it's this really interesting um, movement between the two. But thanks, that's an excellent question. Anyone else? Okay, well, if, if that's it, then let's thank Wendy Chan once again. <laughs>